today I've invited one of my long distance triathlete clients onto the podcast to talk about his experience fueling for a Kona slot. So welcome, Dan Barry. Thanks for joining me. No worries. Thanks, Gemma. Thanks for having me. You're welcome. Now, you got in touch with me probably early December with the goal of, I think your primary goal was getting that Kona slot uh, and improving your day-to-day -day nutrition and your training sort of nutrition. Like, do you want to give me a bit of a picture of where you were at a couple of months ago before we started chatting? Yeah, no, so I think I got in touch with you. I'd just been over and done uh, Bustleton Half Ironman over there. Yeah. Um, and I sort of got in touch with you through discussions with my coach as well. Um, we're sort of at a stage where like, we're going okay. We, I mean, we won the age group 70.3, like my age group comes second overall. Um, but we're like, I think to take it to the next step, we really need to get like a little bit leaner, a leaner, a little bit smarter with, uh, my fueling in that way. So like. Before that race, I was sitting, you know, around the 81, 82 kilos. And in my head, I was like, yeah, I need to be down to the 76-ish sort of range, really. So just obviously the power to weight bet on the bike, but, you know, just makes everything that a little bit easier as well. So, and I never really had explored the, um, the fueling. I was um, very green in that area, that's for sure. Yeah, I find it really interesting because, I mean, I, I got into cycling from triathlon. So I, I, with the exception of the running part of it, like I love, I do love triathlon. And and that was a big part of like, I guess, my journey as a sports dietitian, wondering why so many athletes will spend thousands on gear and kit and events and then not actually put any effort or thought into the nutrition and the fueling, which can make or break how their day actually goes. Yeah, no, that was for sure. I think, you know, I'd, I'd thought about it, but I was always of the opinion that I was like, no, no, I'm, we're doing long distance here. Like, I should be burning, you know, primarily fat, I guess. Mm. Um, And, yeah, it wasn't until, you know, we started talking and a bit of a light bulb when you actually like, oh, hang on, let's look at the actual, you know, calories that you're burning here and you're not even putting anything back in. So. Yeah. And then I was like, okay, yeah, you can burn as much fat as you want or whatever. But, and yeah, just the way whether it was training and racing, how I, how poorly I was probably recovering compared to when we mm. started working together. And yeah, we'll probably get to that. But yeah, like how much better I just started feeling. And, and in, we worked together over, you know, the 12 weeks. 12 to 14 weeks leading into New Zealand and you know through proper fueling and that I, I don't think I didn't miss a day for one yeah so you know yeah, yeah well, that, that, that's it I think it's I think when I'm like when I'm talking a lot about nutrition I like the sort of like the three bubbles that are all interconnected like you've got your everyday nutrition which is for general health you've got your training nutrition and then if you've got an event coming up then you've got like your race nutrition that you want to practice in your training rather than just like leave it to wing it on the day and be like hopefully that works it's it's like actually thinking okay how does the training that I'm doing today relate to what I'm going to do on race day what what am I going to eat for breakfast before my race because that was certainly one of the one of many one of a few things that we we sort of like worked on was your pre-race breakfast wasn't it yeah definitely like I was always one that would uh, I don't know whether it was just like I was just scared almost because I didn't want to have any gut issues during the race or anything like that so I'm like uh, I'm not going to try and eat too much before I race I don't I want to go in there you know generally flushed out for lack of a better term and um but yeah that was something that we were able to you know I think previously I spoke to you I, I raced I'm in this last year and oh, and then previously I'm in New Zealand last year as well and you know pre-race Breakfast was a you know a muesli bar and yeah. that was about it really. So um, yeah, and that was something we identified pretty early in the um, you know the first weeks when you just had a look at what I had been doing and mm -hmm. yeah, no, I think that was one pretty obvious thing that I that I changed up pretty quickly and not just um, pre race 
eating now it's even now like I'm sort of in a bit of a down period but I, I still training when I get up in the morning I'm still eating um that was one thing I, I mean I had to implement it too because obviously I work full time um mm. so the the way I had to do that was you know have to get up an hour earlier eat make sure it's digested and then go and do my session so but yeah, I can definitely notice a huge difference um, through doing that. Well, it's, I mean, it's an interesting point you make about the being scared of the gut issues. I, I see that quite mm. a lot with people. And and then, and it's, it's, it's I find it funny because then we have these conversations with people and they're like, why didn't I think about that? And it, it's so simple, but it's the, these little things that we can really easily overlook. And, and that's why I do like getting people to think of the end in mind. And if you're you're racing early in the morning, well, you want to sort of practice feeling, you don't have to do it every day, but rather than just being like, it's like, okay, use it in a low stress situation versus like on a race day. If you spent a couple of hundred thousand dollars on an event, traveling to it, like that's your key race of the year. You want to know that and feel confident. And so then using those training sessions helps you to be like, does this work? Does this work? How much time do I need to digest this? Like, uh, that was okay. And then slowly build it up versus go from like, yeah, the muesli bar to 150 grams of carbs in one hit and then probably have gut issues. Yeah, I think you were pretty lucky. Like, um, obviously, in a not in the Ironman build, um, uh, we were pretty heavy volume. That um, was working with my coach Clayton, and um, so that did give me, you know, probably at least two, three opportunities a week to test out that pre-race nutrition as such. So, yeah, yeah heading into you know, we are, even though we're only travelling to New Zealand, but I was pretty, um, pretty locked into what I was going to be doing race morning and I, I knew what was going to work what what I could handle and you know probably even now I, and I think we had the chat after New Zealand and I say next time I can probably like boost that up even more you know and really so yeah that'll be the thing now um for the next race is you know testing out oh can I handle 180 grams of carbs mm -hmm. before the race or 200 you know so but yeah, there was some sessions definitely in the um in the lead up to New Zealand where I was like, yeah, oh, I think we definitely got the nutrition um definitely worked out, you know. So, yeah. yeah, I think there's quite a few like especially some of those like long bikes like four or five hour sort of bike sessions where you're like, huh, I've come up with like a new power, like a new threshold. I've come up with some new like average watts increases from like previous sessions. At the end of the ride, you're like, what is this magic? Yeah, no, yeah, hundred percent. So there was, um, you know, I raced the Olympic distance back in January. So like we were mid, mid um Ironman build, went into that fairly um untapered as such. Come up against some pretty um quick guys down in Melbourne, and you know that was a perfect opportunity to really test out what we've been working towards there. Mm -hmm. So um like from like off the top of my head that was like simple things like and things you you know you talk to other people I talked to my wife about and she's like why are you eating that but it was like just the four slices white bread and Nutella like just getting that in and knowing that you know that's going to sit well on yeah. the on the on my gut and testing that race getting like that's only a two-hour race as opposed to you know eight nine hours in the Ironman but you know, get through that two hours and, you know, feel fresh and knowing that, you yeah. know, just push this power. I'm in the middle. I'm under some pretty heavy fatigue from the training, but I've been able to race and, you know, knock out knock out a really good time here and, and have a win. So, um, yeah, that was a really good test. And, yeah, like I said, plenty of those other bricks where we, where we tested it out. We eventually went on to, like, we had the white bread and Nutella there, and that was what I sort of started with. And then we moved on to, oh, hang on, let's try something with a little bit less fibre and because we're going to need, you know, we want to stay hungry as such. We want to get the carbs in <laughs> to stay hungry. So, yeah. Um, and uh, that was where we moved on to another thing where people would laugh is moved on to the Cocoa Pops. So, yeah, and that was what seemed to work. So, 
I know it's like I'm I'm sure I'll have all the the haters come back at me for it, but this is where like there's everyday nutrition and there's race nutrition. And this is where this is not the food that I'm recommending you eat every day. <laughs> but it's like specific foods for specific purposes. And then as you said, like your race day, your carb load the day before or your breakfast, you're probably not gonna want as much fire, but you're not gonna be wanting to feel like, oh, I'm so heavy. And that's certainly an error I've seen people make mistakes in with the carb load is they're trying to do it healthy and and they're having this high fiber diet and they're feeling really full or they're leaving it all to dinner and then feeling super full, waking up race day, still full from the night before. Whereas we make these little tweaks and adjustments, cut the fiber back, have more of the like energy dense but low volume foods like the juice, the cocoa pops um, for a specific purpose and be able to get more in race well and as you experience like you finish your racing like okay I can I, I can do another training session I'm still fresh here what's going on yeah no, that's exactly right and yeah like I said it's even, like yeah we yeah, eat this well lack of it again it's, you know not the ideal food but when you're training I guess you know you're 22 23 hours a week and you're doing it um predominantly with the idea that this is just this is filming in my session and I've looked at the session what does it require and yeah. and why am I doing it I'm doing it because I've got a race and this is what I want to try and eat before that so yeah yeah exactly um, it's like that specific purpose like what's the duration what's the intensity and what fuel is best for that and and you mentioned before about the fat versus the carbs and yeah like when you're going lower intensity more steady state we want to be efficient at using fat as fuel because we physically can't eat as enough carbs to match our expenditure but at the same time if we're going fast we need to be fueling with the carbs that we need to maintain that sort of speed versus you get halfway through and like doo -doo -doo -doo, the speed starts like falling off yeah no 100 percent. and that was yeah that was definitely sort of a challenge as well is you know over the 12 weeks is we just um slowly increase you know that rate rate per hour of carbs um and again specific to each session but you know obviously with those specific whether it was a brick session or something like that it was yeah slowly increasing and uh obviously being specific looking at what what's going to be on course like what do you plan how are you gonna are you gonna carry it all your nutrition are you gonna use what's on course so yeah like i think pretty early on we started um doing a lot of my runs sort of testing the coke out which yeah. you know obviously that's an easy one that they got on course and like in New Zealand that was sort of predominantly what I used on course was just the coke and just you know <laughs> I had a few days there where I'm you know probably look crazy using the, the using the thermomix as the scale weighing weighing cups of coke to make sure see how <laughs> many grams of carbs is in a in every um every cup but yeah you know that that was just I don't know yeah it was all the things that you need to do just to be specific to know that when you get to race day um you can run past an aid station no, all right I'm going to grab you know 20 grams worth of carbs here or whatever it is yeah yeah and then using it intentionally versus being like oh, where's the next one I'm, I'm just trying to survive until the next one yeah absolutely and yeah, but that's a, a hell thing too. Is probably the run in in New Zealand. Um, uh, yeah, I probably could have hit like a little bit more carbs in that, but I was yeah. I don't know. When you're in the moment, you probably just you know forget a little bit about that yeah. sort of thing. Um, uh, but you know, we still got the job done in the end. So. Well, see, I mean, it's funny because I mean, when I was doing my my PhD research, the the run running was generally the leg where people undervalue fueling the most, mm. or and and I think it's interesting because sometimes we don't. It's that brain mindset thing of like, oh, I don't need it. I'm not hungry until we feel it, and then when we feel it and we're hungry, that's kind of like it's too late. We needed it like half an hour ago, kind of thing. So it's that whole proactive fueling. And thinking of like, okay, I may not feel like I need it, but I still need it right now. Yeah, and I definitely like, 
that's one thing. Obviously, it's easier on the bike. So, you, as mm. most people know, you sort of we're front load, front loading our food intake on the bike, getting ready for the run, trying to reduce that deficit a little bit. But yeah, you still got to be trying to get it in there on the run and trying to work out what you can um, safely ingest, I guess, and know that it's, you know, you're going to be able to run. It's not going to play, play up if you got. So, um, yeah. yeah, the Coke was one that, yeah, it seemed to, to sit pretty well. So, yeah. yeah, I mean, it's, it, it's, this is the thing with nutrition is that I think there's sports nutrition products and there's foods that are out there that are designed specifically for, for performance. And a lot of it is convenience factor. They're all packaged up, but there's a lot of everyday foods that you can use that you can buy anywhere in the world that are just as efficient. And Coke is always an interesting one because it was the whole, like the people were using it before the research was there to show that it was beneficial and and yeah it's it's something like I wouldn't necessarily be recommending it as an everyday food but in the context of if you want fast fuel that's tasty that's easy to drink that's palatable and isn't overwhelmingly sweet it's it's fantastic yeah for sure like obviously on the bike I use you know most of your you know your gels and hmm. um just the stuff that was uh more easily carried in a way um and yeah it's got to be practical you know, drink, this, and this is one of those tips sort of i'm thing, always so. like thinking okay so what's your bike set up have you got a bento box have you got bottle how many bottles have you got have you got a bottle in front like are you picking up bottles are you wanting to have a concentrated mix like there are all these like little tiny tricks that i think a lot of times people don't think about it until the day before and then they're like oh what am i going to do and just wing it Whereas if you practice it, then you can kind of like, oh, that didn't really work. Or like, oh, that works super well. I'm going to keep doing that. Yeah, that was really, yeah, sort of one of the things like, as like thing that I learned through the training and I did take into the race was um, having a bit of a mix of fuels as well. Um, mm -hmm. So a lot of the time during training, I mean, you don't want to go and be spending $5 on a gel every time. So like we were like, using snakes you know mm. your, you know just lollies in general and so yeah I knew that I, I'd had some of my really good sessions having lollies so um yeah and just whether it's you know a snake knowing that that's 10 grams of carbs straight straight there so yeah on the race day for the first in couple of hours I was yeah you know you've got you can do it on the bike you use it where you can whether it's if it's a climb when you're going a bit slower or something yeah. like that, when you can get to it, like you just got to, yeah, you have a look at the course profile and you can sort of adjust what you're going to have. If you can't, if you're going to be in the aero position all the time, obviously it's going to be, you need something quick rather than, and trying to chew or, you know, get it out of a bento box, which yeah. is just going to, you're going to break your aero position. So yeah, it is, um, it's just been having the right planning and, and knowing what you're going to use on the day. So. Yeah, and, and different races will have different challenges. And when you're kind of aware of those challenges and think about them in advance, then you can kind of adapt and, and prepare for them. And it's, I think it's interesting because within with triathlon and, and cycling, but similar, I think I find that it's often many people will make um, three years worth of just kind of like winging it and making mistakes before they kind of like try and figure out. They're like, oh, yeah, I think that kind of that, that works enough. But it, they could they could be missing out on so much of their performance gains and I mean I know that I'm in New Zealand this year for you say it was it was a slow day in terms of the weather and the the environment but how much faster were you this year with the fueling compared to last year yeah so uh last year I think I was yeah around the 932 I think and yeah probably was a better day and yeah this year was sorry um 8.57, so yeah, we're looking, yes, 35 minutes quicker this year, so, um, also last year, you know, had terrible cramps and fade towards the end of the run, whereas this, this year, um, yeah, it was pretty solid most of the way, like, um, yeah. still faded a little bit, but my fade was sort of no worse than anyone that was behind me, so still managed to, you know, still run faster than the age than anyone else in the age group field so um, yeah so yeah, yeah like as much as I 35 minute improvement on your time for the same race on a slow 
day. Yeah, yeah, like, yeah, slower condition rise. Um, yeah. yeah, majority of that was probably, you know, there was probably five minutes slower in the swim, even for the pros on the day. Um, probably for me, one of the main things that, you know, you like New Zealand because it is a mass start race and mm -hmm. everyone, you know, there, you just, everyone start at the same time so you can see where, where people are and you're just, you're racing. So that seems to suit me better. I like it to be able to know where people are and um yeah that was uh but it's definitely I sold a lot lot stronger than I did last year I, and having you know a couple more iron hands in the belt as well always helps so yeah no absolutely because because yeah like the some I guess some of the biggest obviously your training has adapted and improved over the last year but the the nutrition played a big role in that with the fueling and the training your body composition changing as well as um, being able to have practiced it and be able to fuel more consistently before, during and after your, your event too. Yeah, absolutely. Like I said, um, yeah, I think it was probably more, yeah, it was myself. I knew that I had to do something, but yeah, it was sort of a coach played and was like, yeah, all right, if we're going to, that's just the way I went to him and said, oh, look, when I first approached him in October, that was probably the first change towards New Zealand because I knew I wanted to go back there. I knew I could improve and, like, deep down, I was like, I want to go there and win. So mm -hmm. I approached Clayton, did Bustleton, and we're like, oh, yeah, what to do that? We've got to get Lena. It's like, probably, like, an unpopular term, but it's like, oh, yeah, you know, if you're going to do it, you got to get serious. So that's when you approach yourself and... We were able to, yeah, change body, change body composition, got down to that sort of 76 kilo race weight. But through doing that, like, there's no doubt, yeah, lost all that weight, but I was probably eating more than I ever had. So, you know. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I know people don't believe me. They'll, I'm like, I'll, I'll get you eating more than you're eating currently. They're like, yeah, right, whatever. I'm like, no, I will. <laughs> Watch me. Yeah, 100%. Like, I think when, I, when we started... It was one of the my bad habits was I was just a prolific late night snacker, late night snacker. So, yeah. and there wasn't any like drastic changes. All I did was don't eat it at night. It was like we'll oh, save that and wake up in the morning, have it, and feel the session with it rather than it just I don't know lingering and you know transforming transforming to your fat rather than being able to just use that energy straight away so yeah. yeah I mean and this is the thing that I see a lot is that like the the num people fixate on the numbers or the outcome or like oh I'm I'm I can't, I'm addicted to this like I can't stop snacking whereas like that's just the outcome of the mismatch and the timing and so we get the fueling timing better aligned we get the quality of food better aligned to what you're doing and then those problems or bad habits just stop without you and you're like wait wait what what is this magic <laughs> yeah 100 percent. i was like i think that was probably the biggest thing that i learned was timing timing mm. was my, and the biggest change really so um timing getting eating that you know pre during and just post within you know 30 to 60 minutes post and then yeah you get to that later in the day or whenever you are and you're like I don't need to eat anymore like as I I've, yeah. I've I've put the calories back in that I need to um my recovery's kick started but through that um and then if I'm gonna eat later in the day well I can just have either a smaller meal or just eat your normal healthy yeah. sort of you know something I yeah like I said it's not really rocket science is it so you just it is a lot of, I think I find a lot of the time that it's like the psychology of it and changing the timing of it and, and putting it into, into practice. And, and this is why I like getting people to do like, for me, the goal is not to do those food diaries forever, but it's helping you to see those links because like I can see the patterns straight away, but I, I want you to see them and then to start experimenting and dabbling with them and then feel the difference for yourself and be like, ah, oh, this is different. I like this. Yeah, absolutely. And that was, yeah, like I said, it was sort of the biggest difference. Like I've got two young kids, so at night, you know, I think the, what what would happen is, you know, we eat dinner at 5, 5.30 and then 
previously, I'm like, oh, don't go to bed till say eight thirty, nine o'clock, and I'm like, oh, I need to eat something else. Like, and that was just a habit that I got into. But then eventually, like, and through like, it's uh, it's just breaking those habits, but also. It's just like, yeah, that little trick of going, hang on, you know, you want to eat something now. And like my go-to was always just coconut yogurt and granola, a bit of peanut butter. <laughs> but I was eating that at night and I just go, oh, let's just hang on and I'll eat that in, eat that in the morning, seal the yeah. session with that. And, you know, that was, and it makes a huge difference. So, yeah. yeah. And, and this is yeah. where I find it. It's not just the numbers because you could be, eat, I find that like people are fixated on the numbers um, you're probably eating the exact same amount of calories and protein and maybe a little bit of change, but the numbers look the same, but just the distribution flips around, which influences how your body uses it, which influences how you you recover, how you train. And you mentioned before how you did you you lost all this weight in the midst of a training, a heavy training block right before competition. So it wasn't like you were just sort of doing steady state, you're doing high intensity 20 plus hours a week of training and still losing weight and getting better quality training out of it. Yeah. And um, yeah, backing up, like just backing it up and staying consistent, which is um, that's really the aim of the game for Ironman training is just putting those weeks together. So like, if you go, yeah, if you, if you miss a week or you miss a session or, I mean, probably afford to miss one session, but you know, you've got to really be hitting them and hitting them with quality. So and, yeah, and, yeah, and, and, not and not get sick in the process either because that's certainly something I see a lot of times when people are like cutting their calories and under fueling their training is that the training quality suffers but then they get sick which then makes it even worse and so rather than moving forwards maybe they they lose some of the weight but they're losing muscle mass more than actual fat mass which makes them slower and weaker and the opposite of what they're trying to achieve yeah and I think like yeah the the weight drop was um it was probably visually visually quicker than it was like on the scales like on the scales it was just very steady steady decline I think I've, I've showed you like I'm probably a bit of a psycho with graphs and stuff like that so like you can see like how slow the trend is but um mm. yeah I think um, just visually you'd have yeah commenting people would be like oh like what are you doing like why like how do you get all those veins in your legs? <laughs> like one comment I get quite a bit. I'm like, oh, I don't know. Man. That's just uh, that's just what, how it is. <laughs> but, um, yeah. That was yeah. That like I said, that we yeah, we had that sort of there was just a slow slow sort of build up in the drop in the weight, but you know. And what I was going to say yeah before is when you mentioned not getting sick is like. I'm actually like, I'm really surprised by that because normally, like even with um, 70.3s and stuff like that, I normally like I go do the race and then previously I've always got sick after it and I'm like, I'm now sitting here, what are we, like three weeks post, I mean, you know, I'm like, I'm just waiting to get sick and I still <laughs> haven't got sick. So yeah. like, I'm like, like I've had, I've had sick kids and my wife was sick earlier in the week and I'm like, oh, I'm still like tracking along here and not getting sick. So I'm like, yeah, yeah like touch will we do it? I can maintain that for a little bit. So oh, that's it because your body like has been fueled appropriately so you can cope with the load and then re recalibrate afterwards versus that like, usually, I guess a lot of times if people are in these, these lagging deficits, they do the race and then they stop and then the body falls apart and then it might take them weeks or months to sort of get back to get back on track and and that's the beauty of I guess this framework and I find for longevity is that you've got your baseline and then you add food in for the training each day which means that you might be any, eating anywhere from like 2,000 to five, 6,000 calories a day but the that extra is all coming in training so the training stops the extra isn't there and I find then I'll be interested to hear how you found post race your weight if that stayed really stable or if that's changed at all since yeah, because we haven't spoken for like, yeah, a couple of weeks. Yeah, so I think I raced around 76 and now like I'm still sitting around sort of the 78, 8 kilos at the moment. And mm. um, yeah, I think like we spoke just before this, I think I've only really been this week, which we're now two, three weeks post where I've really like got my 
mojo back to get into into the training. So um yeah, I think my yeah, the weight has stayed um stayed pretty, stable. Pretty, pretty well and yeah, it's really just starting to add some speed back in now for sort of the next race, which is a, a seventy point three. So and yeah, I'm yeah, still feeling really good. So and still and using the same more about the the body composition how you feel the difference sometimes before you see it and that's why I like getting people to have outcome measures more than just a number on the scale because the scale is a lag measure and and it's and it's unreliable because it jumps up and down with your training if you're stressed if you're like fluid retention carb intake and all that sort of stuff but the yeah, like I see it a lot where people are fueling more, they're visibly getting leaner, but because the, the number on the scale hasn't shifted, they're like, oh, this isn't working. But then their power is going up and they're getting faster. And I'm like, what are you actually trying to achieve? Like it, it's the it's the whole sort of package and the body composition overall of like being the strongest, healthiest version of yourself. And yeah, maybe your race weight is that 76 kilos, but your stable walk around rate is one or two above where you're not having to think about it and you're just eating well, adapting on a daily basis around what's going on with your training yeah and like like i said like your weight it, it'll fluctuate yeah. so much like i don't know week to week or you know different days of the week you could be you know three to four kilos different really or um but yeah that's the thing i was like obviously post the race there's a few days that you have there you just like you let it slip a little bit because you are you know, you just got through this three to four months of being, you know, I mean, not that we're necessarily strict or anything like that, but it's yeah. just like just being um, on it with the, the timing more, more, more so. Um, but I know that, you know, it probably would take me, you know, it probably only take a week really. And I know that uh, yeah, I'm back on track and um, yeah, it probably the scale would even start reflecting we know what I was trying to do so I know that it sort of doesn't take that much really and it's using some of those you know the tricks that we use whether it's uh, you know you can still have lollies if you really want to you just do it while you're having a ride while you're riding and then yeah. after that uh, you're probably not going to want them because you you've just eaten so much sugar <laughs> so yeah, yeah it's reframing it's reframing yeah. sort of foods and it's not a case of it being good or bad um I think the more like you, you've got kids so you know that you tell them they can't have something what happens they want it more like we're not that much different as adults and we tell ourselves like, I can't eat that it just builds up that internal sort of desire whereas reframing it of like, okay well where could I use this food and and where is it going to be useful and okay the lollies for the higher intensity the hot cross buns for the more the steady state um, social sort of rides and playing around with when you eat it when you're I guess when I, you fuel your training well you realize how much food you can eat <laughs> on the bike and how much extra you can have and if you're using real food it's not going to cost you an arm and a leg in the process either. Yeah, absolutely. And like, like we say, like if you, you realize how much food that you can eat and properly utilize um, through your training, then you finish your training and go, oh, you know, I don't want to eat that. Like give me some vegetables or give, like, yeah. give, me, give me that, you know, it's, or, you know, I find something. that psychology yeah. so fascinating because like, I mean, I, I had a client this week accused or not accused, but his wife is like, is she a hypnotist or something? Cause you've gone from being like, a, like an ice cream addict to not wanting to eat the ice cream kind of thing. But it's when your body's getting what it needs, like the, the cravings and the desires just, they just drop. And so you're not, you're not craving that sugar because that craving tends to come from your body being in a position of like not necessarily starvation, but like severe deficit that it's just trying to naturally be like, oh, hype me up. I need sugar. I need to like get back to like a normal playing field here. Yeah, no, hundred percent. So yeah, that's, yeah. One of the huge differences I think that that, that sort of made because yeah, I, previously it was really, really severely under fueling a lot of the sessions to the point where I just yeah wouldn't even eat during the session because I was like I've either I've got this is the way to lose weight is you know just you know 
don't eat, sweat it out, do as much as you can. But yeah, then, you know, what had happened later in the day is you just, you do put it all back in eventually. And, and just, yeah. And, and tend to go above and like, beyond. Yeah, 100%. Like, because your body is just, you know, screaming out for it really by that stage. So. Yeah, and then but I think a lot of times people will blame themselves, like, I don't have good willpower, I don't have self-control. And I'm like, if you're tired, if you're fatigued, like, you could have the best willpower in the world, but you're just going to override it and default to what it is quickest or, like, fastest fuel and the, that shortcut. And whereas you have given yourself the food and the fuel that it needs, there's still a deficit in training because we're just physically incapable of eating enough on the bike or in the run or, the, like, in the swim, whatever. Um, but it means that you're in a better headspace to be like, make smart choices, intentional choices the rest of the day. Actually, they'll get the swim. That's That was an era we, I started getting you to fuel in the swimming sessions as well, didn't I? Yeah, 100%. Yeah, that was sort of a thing. I think previously I'd just have, you know, a bottle with maybe some like electrolyte or something in there, like really not giving me any, no energy at all. And like some of those times where early morning swims where yeah you're getting up and not eating not eating at all so then yeah to go to um probably yeah like we said with swimming is a is a hard one to to know you know how much well one how much you're feeling like I guess running riding you're you're sweating or I don't know you feel like you you want to eat in a way or you, you, can or measure. you just you can see yeah it. yeah or you can actually eat, like, I mean, open water, obviously you can't stop and eat, but in the pool, it's, yeah, have the, the drink mixes or, you know, maybe have some some food on the side of the pool, you know, that, that's easy to digest. And, um, yeah, that, even that is a, a huge difference. So, uh, especially when then you've got to go and uh, back up another session either that night or later in the day, so... Or go to work. <laughs> or go to work. Yeah, that's right. So. Yeah, I think that whole like fueling for performance, I think it's not just, for me, it's not just about the training, but it's performance for your everyday life. Because if you, yeah, you do that swim, you do that early morning bike or run and you're exhausted, then you go to work and you're kind of like not really fully present. I mean, I remember when I was doing triathlon and Ironman training, I was, yeah, I was working full time and I was training probably 20 hours a week training like before work, after work, lunchtime. And in hindsight, I definitely wasn't eating anywhere near enough, but this was before while still training as a sports dietitian. And, and yeah, I can look back and see how they probably didn't have my full brain capacity um, when I was at work because I wasn't as switched on because I was a little bit fatigued constantly all the time. Yeah. And and that's, yeah. The one thing that, sort of I can't sort of let let go either like I think that was just to add another thing into the um the build into Ironman as I did I started a, a new job um in the middle of January um I work as a high voltage technician um it's yeah just fancy electrician really um and yeah I mean that's the thing like you want to go in to a new job you want to sort of make a good impression um so you want to be switched on when you're there. Um, yeah. And then the other thing is, yeah, working, you know, seven to four, come home and then be switched to dad mode as well and get through to your, your Yeah, you, you want know, to be present your and dinner. with your kids and spend time with them and, and have them remember you as someone that has time to play with them too. <laughs> yeah, 100%. And that's the thing is, like, dedicate that time. Um and then, you know, then they go to bed. Then it's, all right, now sort of the training or I go and not only not to forget you, your partner as well, you need to spend time, you know, catching up as well. So yeah. um, that was sort of the, yeah, that, anyone that's sort of done Ironman or, and work full time is sort of top age groupers will know, like, you've got to plan, got to plan everything really. And with the um the nutrition in mind was um that's got to be planned as well so like that, it's not just oh when am I going to do the session it's or oh, when am I going to eat for the session <laughs> and when and do I allow, I allow time for that as well 
Um, yeah. What am I going to eat? Um, and I mean, it's all those, it's, yeah, it seems like a lot, but, you know, it's all those little differences that add up in the end and allow you to back up the next day. Um, not, you know, put yourself in a hole and not be able to train, mm. not, not um, underperform at work or um, be present anymore with your family. So, you know, yeah. you've got to put that plan in place. And the other, once the plan's there, it's, you've got to stick to it as well, really. So, um, yes, you, have, you can have time to shuffle and adjust it around, but um, that basic structure of it has to, has to be there and you can't just go oh, I don't feel like doing that now it's like no nah. like this is the time I've I've allowed for it this is the time yeah. my family's allowed me to do it or work's allowed me to do it so you know I've got to do it really so yeah and, it's that whole remembering your why why it's important to you why why it matters yeah 100 percent. and yeah I didn't need to yeah like my motivation was pretty high because I, I knew what the goal was going in there. I mean, you can go on easy runs and I'm visualising the finish line of, um, yeah. of Ironman and visualising winning. Um, so I knew, yeah, the motivation was high that whole time. And yeah, yeah. Tell maybe me, that's why I've had. Yeah, how, like, yeah, because spoiler alert, you did win. You did get your Kona slot. What was that experience like um, getting to the finish line, knowing? you did achieved your goal um yeah it was sort of it was it was funny like I think yeah if I asked my wife or Clayton my coach like to come out and I was sort of I had a poor swim I always have a poor swim so (laughs) (laughs) that's yeah um I think yeah I was sitting sort of about you know 50th like overall age group coming off the bike um and then by 45 Ks, I think I was up to about, I think I was sitting in second at that stage. So, um, and then first lap, you go through 90 K mark. Um, and I was going past a couple of the pro guys and I'm like, oh, I think I might be going all right here for a little bit. <laughs> so yeah, I probably, and then, yeah, that second lap, sort of the wind coming back into town was um, really draining and probably backed it off a bit and knew, oh, I could tell there was still one guy in front of me. Um, I didn't know there was someone sort of had rode up on me a little bit. Um, but I was like, oh, I, I, I feel I'm pretty good. I know I can trust my run. Um, all my indications during the training were that, you know, I was going to have a, a pretty strong run. So, yeah, coming out of transition, um, sort of first and second um, together, um and yeah I felt the first lap of the run I felt unreal like probably as you do I was felt really really good and I think I sort of put a lead of about four minutes in the first 10 k's and that sort of pushed out to about sort of the seven-ish minutes by you know 30 30 k's and the whole time I was just I probably I was just so, super conscious knowing that anything can happen in an Ironman, you know, especially what had happened to me the previous year in New Zealand and just cramping at the 34K mark and spending time on the ground. I'm like, I don't know anything can happen here. I'm like, I'm not, until I see that finish line, like I know yeah. I'm not, I'm not, like, I'm not counting any chickens until I see that finish line really. So, but yeah, when, when I did and then, yeah, coming around the sort of finish line and um, knowing that it had all sort of, all the sacrifice for mostly my family and allowing me to do that, like that all that had paid off, you know, mm. that was when it actually sort of hit you. And no, not the sacrifice of that, knowing that all these things that we'd put in place, everything had, had paid off and worked out. So, yeah. you know, and we got sort of got what we came for so yeah yeah so yeah next stop next stop Kona yeah that's yeah we'll go um Kona in October and you know I'm even keen to you know explore then test some more on the nutrition because you know I don't I think it's probably sort of a, a bit of a 
never ending puzzle like you can always you can always it's always evolving and because yeah, yeah. your life evolves and you change is like you'll have periods like now where you've had a bit less training and then you have periods of time where you're training and racing and that that's just life it's those shifts and evolutions and constant tweaks and adjustments of where you are what you're trying to get out of it it's not about being perfect but playing around and establishing how your body is reacting and responding to those different environments for sure yeah 100 percent. so yeah i've got um a couple of races sort of between now and now in kona where like i'm excited just to even like get a half i'm in in port macquarie coming up and i'm like oh yeah like this will be a really a good another chance to see what can i how much can i can i feel prior to the race and and feel yeah. good so yeah yeah, because um, I mean, or like with with Ironman New Zealand, I think you went up to basically 100 grams an hour on the bike and then 80 grams an hour on the run, which is a massive increase from what you had previously previously sort of done. And like you've you've seen the benefits of that and in in training and in racing, which helps you to give you that confidence of knowing going into that race like this works and I don't need to stress about it I don't need to uh, I've got it planned I've got it organized I've got it with me I can grab stuff if I need to because I've already tested it but you've got that clarity and confidence knowing that you you'll be able to perform your best with what the day brings you yeah that's right and like you said like exactly what we did with New Zealand it's then we're going over you know to Kona in the states you know the aid stations might be a little bit different, like with what they carry. Um, totally different client uh, climate. Sorry, you know it's going to be warm. Coming I mean, like I live in Victoria in Australia, so you know it's going to be a long cold winter trying to train to go to go to Hawaii. But you know that's it's all part of it. There's been plenty of people that have done it before, so um, it's either yeah, lean on that. There's things we can play around with, with you know heat adaptation and the fueling but yeah like i was gonna say if it's kona their aid stations they'll have different stuff so you know it's just about planning planning again so yeah and knowing what we're gonna come up against on uh on race day over there yeah absolutely and that that's very much how i work with people to like yourself to just help you rather than gatekeep all the information it's like okay here's all the things that we could be coming across getting you to start thinking about them and and tweaking them and and testing them out versus like here's your meal plan off you go was there anything that particularly surprised you that about the way that we work together that it was different from what you expected um yeah, I think I probably did come in saying, oh, well, yeah, you probably look at my diet and go, oh, geez, you probably eat a lot of crap or something like that. Um, you need to change change that. But it wasn't really, there was no hard nose or anything like that. It's just, hang on, let's just, let's tweak a few things. There's no, not really any sort of, there was no meal plans or anything as such, like, it's it's just about yeah it was I just had never even taken into consideration really the, the timing was how important that was and that was mm. definitely like one of the biggest things for me to just to learn to learn that really so yeah and that's why I like getting people to track so like I think you stopped tracking after a couple of weeks it wasn't even very very long the goal for me the goal with the tracking is there to help you understand what's in the food and how that relates to your training and yeah like what am I eating on the bike what am, or what am I eating in snacks like oh 40 percent of my food is coming from snacks interesting and rather than using that as a source of judgment or shame or like oh such a bad diet whatever it's like well okay how about getting curious like what if we shifted that to this would that still be a problem? And and I find that this like working, starting with what you're currently doing and then building it up, building it up with, yeah, there might be 10 different things we can focus on, but a couple of them will be the big game changers for you. And when you like knuckle on and nail down those, all the other issues resolve without you even having to think about them because they're just the aftermath of the timing or the types of foods that you're having at other points of the day. 
Yeah, hundred percent. So I think yeah, the like the two biggest things were timing, timing for the it was probably the biggest benefactor for the weight loss, and then um, appropriately fueling the sessions just led to yeah. um, better performance in general. Um, yeah. Hitting hitting all the session um, requirements and then and backing it up as well. So you know, I think yeah, yeah I was consistently sort of going through the whole Ironman block with, um, you know, all the metrics, HRV, rest and heart rate, just, you know, sitting rock solid sort of the whole time. And, mm. um, yeah, I no doubt that that was due to properly fueling everything. So, yeah, yeah. that's it. You, I mean, you hit the nail on the head. It's, it's the eating more at the right time and, the, and, and that, that key, anchor for that is is the training and so yeah it makes makes me very happy to hear and see how it's helped you with your training with the quality of the life as well as the body composition on and off the bike and but yeah no thank you so much for coming and sharing your experience and um good luck with all the the training well good luck with port mac and i'm sure i'll see you again at some point in the future somewhere someday no worries. Yeah, thanks, Jermaine. I'll just quickly, yeah, like, thanks for all your help. And I think, like, that's probably one benefit that I didn't expect was being able to help others as well, like, within yeah. the, the training group and just um, increase my own knowledge. And then yeah. it is nice Yeah, people come to you and want to know, what have you done? And yeah. to be able to help them is, is really good. And, yeah, thanks for that. I know well that's well that's my goal that's my mission is like to have that ripple effect and change the culture of eating is cheating to feeling for performance in endurance sport because yeah I see the impact that it has and and I do love the the ripple effect like you get one person feeling well and then everyone's like what are you doing like what's different and then they're like I'm eating more they're like that can't work I'm like yeah it works look watch (laughs) and and then more people start dabbling and start dabbling and that's how we we shift this sort of culture and get people feeling well and having healthier healthier happier lives so no I'm I'm glad to hear that you've um, had people sort of approaching you and and you've been able to share that knowledge and experience also yeah no it's been really nice nice to be able to do that and, and give back so yeah Uh, Thanks for having me on. You're welcome. Great to have you and I'll see you soon. All right. Thank you.